Welcome everyone to the global NCG seminar. This is the first time I, I got to say that, global NCG seminar, it sounds good, uh, to the Americas um, component of the global NCG seminar. Our speaker today is uh, Pierre Albin, who I guess has family connections to uh, your family story, spans Mexico and America, as far as I remember. And so you're a real North American, if, if nothing else. And it's a great pleasure to have you here today. The title of Pierre's talk is The Subramanian Limit of a Contact Manifold. Please, Pierre. Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to speak. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, joint work uh, with my student, Hadrian Juan. <clears throat> and uh, I was planning to, to mention um, coincidentally that he was on the market for a postdoc uh, but as it happens, he, he just accepted a postdoc today. So I'm sorry to say he's now off the market. Uh, so the plan of the talk, uh, I'll um, tell you about contact manifolds, uh, mostly just to uh, um, fix the notation and remind you of the Riemann complex, a complex of differential forms on a contact manifold that that uh, modifies the Duram complex to take into account the contact structure, but continues to compute the Duram cohomology. Then I'll remind you or tell you about the Mattel Melrose approach to spectral sequences <clears throat> and explain how that uh, would lead you to the Riemann complex uh, you know, without any extra thought required. Uh, Ruman actually uh, derived the complex just, um, from uh, good guesses um, based on homogeneity principles, but uh, the Mattel Melrose approach would, would let the analysis get the complex for you. And then I'll describe how the, this uh, approach to the spectral sequence uh, tells you what space the heat kernel um, and their traces heat kernels and their traces will be well behaved. And here I mean the heat kernels of the uh, Hodge uh, Laplacians. Okay, so a contact manifold, as you all know. M, so I'll use M for the dimension, is an odd dimensional manifold. So I'll use M is 2M plus 1. And I'm going to assume that it's co oriented for simplicity. The differential form theta of degree one, such that theta wedge d theta to the n is a volume form. So a nowhere vanishing form of top degree. The contact distribution is the kernel of this differential form, and it is a subbundle of the tangent bundle. Uh, the model case uh, to keep in mind is the Heisenberg group. So let me briefly tell you in, in three dimensions, this is R3, but considered with a different group structure. So I'm going to use uh, the contact form DC plus one half X dy minus Y dx. So the contact distribution is the span. So there's the null space of theta. So you can see if I plug in dx, then I get this coefficient of minus y, so uh, over two. So I need to fix that with a, say, a multiple of dz. And same thing if I start with a dy. So you can see that this has rank two, right? It's clear that it's not gonna have rank three because dz, for example, is not in the kernel of theta. And uh, so it is not uh, equal to all of the tangent bundle. However, it has the nice property that if we call this spectral bundle X and this spectral bundle Y, then you can see that the commutator, the Lie bracket gives you DZ. And so if you're given these two vector fields and you're allowed to take Lie brackets, then of course you can generate all the vector fields on uh, the manifold, on R3 in this case. So that's great. So going back to our general contact manifold, this leads to two ways of making M into a metric space. One thing we could do, 
to get a Riemannian manifold. Take as your metric d theta <clears throat> together with a uh, compatible almost complex structure and then add theta tensor theta. This is a Riemannian metric and so we get a, a metric space in the usual way. But there's also a sub Riemannian metric you could take which is just take this part, a bundle metric on the horizontal uh, subbundle or the uh, contact distribution. <clears throat> and then a theorem of Chow, also known as uh, chow reshevsky theorem, uh, says that <clears throat> because of this maximally uh, non-integrable uh, structure for H, uh, any two points can be joined by a curve tangent to H. So a curve whose tangent vector is always in the contact distribution. In particular, since I have a metric, a bundle metric on the contact distribution, I can measure the length of these tangent vectors. And so I can measure the length of curves if they're tangent to the contact distribution. And then by taking the infimum among such curves, I get a distance function on the manifold. So we have two metric space structures and they're related as pointed out by Gromov <clears throat> what you could do is put a weight, penalize uh, curves for moving in the vertical direction. The, 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 uh, we're gonna call the complement of the horizontal, the vertical. Uh, so penalize curves for moving in the, in the vertical direction. And as epsilon goes to zero, the former metric space converges to the latter in the gromov hausdorff topology. Okay, so one thing that Ruman showed is that the, um, there's a sort of limit of the Duram complex as you're doing this. Which is now known as the Roman complex. Okay, so let's let R be the red field. So this is the vector field determined by uh, plugging in to theta to give you one and plugging in to d theta to give you zero. <clears throat> so we can write a splitting of the tangent bundle as um, the horizontal uh, bundle plus just the span of R, the corresponding splitting of the cotangent bundle, <clears throat> and thus of the differential forms on M with respect to this splitting, <clears throat> the exterior derivative becomes a two by two matrix. Where here L is the exterior product with respect to D theta. L star is, I'll denote it's dual by L star. And then the Roman complex can be identified below middle degree we'll take the kernel of L star and uh, the forms that don't have a theta and above middle degree we'll take the kernel Uh, the kernel of L and the forms that do have a theta. 
So the exterior derivative induces two complexes on, um, on these differential forms. So the low middle degree up to degree n, we get a complex just compressing the exterior derivative. And then again, above middle degree, And what uh, Ruman found was that you can uh, put these two complexes together into a single complex. Oh, sorry. Uh, with a, an operator here, but interestingly, this is an operator of order two. So one formula for DH is the following. So uh, two things to notice, so this is acting on M. Uh, one is that this is an operator of order two. I have two times the exterior derivative here. Uh, and that uh, the, uh, the DC direction, the red vector field direction, uh, only shows up with one derivative. So uh, it's the correct homogeneity here is that this direction has to count for twice. Uh, what the other directions count. Um, and so you can think of that also as being present in the Heisenberg group example. Uh, I needed two vector fields, X and Y, uh, in the form of their commutator to cook up the vector field DZ. So DC is going to be acting as if it were an operator of order two. Okay, so that's the Riemann complex. <clears throat> now I wanna tell you about uh, a way of uh, deriving this complex uh, following the mattel melrose approach to spectral sequences. Uh, so this was developed by mattel melrose in the context of the Larry Serre spectral sequence and subsequently uh, studied more by Sean Sedai to understand the, um, what it implied for the behavior of the spectrum of the Hodge Laplacian, uh, Dai and Melrose to figure out what it meant for analytic torsion, and then Foreman and um, Kordyakov and um, Alvarez Lopez have uh, studied it for, for other uh, spectral sequences. So, right, so of course the spectral sequence here is just derived from the inclusion of the, or the contact distribution as a sub bundle of the tangent bundle. Um, but the way we're going to do this is more geometrically. Uh, the idea is to take the one parameter family of metrics uh, that we saw above um, from Gromov. We're gonna incorporate the parameter epsilon into the space to form this X. And then we're gonna restrict attention to vector fields Uh, that have finite pointwise length, bounded pointwise length with respect to this, um, this metric. So I'm going to denote things with SR to stand for sub Riemannian limit. So the SR vector fields are gonna be the smooth vector fields on X uh, for which the epsilon is just a parameter. So if you differentiate epsilon, you get zero. And because epsilon is just a parameter, it makes good sense to restrict them to epsilon equal to zero. And what we want is that when we do that, we end up with a horizontal vector field. So something in the contact distribution. Now we can apply the Serre Swan theorem or just a direct construction by specifying a basis and checking how it changes under coordinate uh, transformations to see that there's a vector bundle I'll denote the SR tangent bundle, whose space of sections is an inverted commas, 
the SR vector fields. So of course, really what I mean is that there is a vector field, the vector bundle over X, together with a, a vector bundle map to the tangent bundle of X, so that the image of the smooth sections of this vector bundle are exactly these vector fields. The advantage to doing this is that, for example, epsilon times R times the red vector field as a section of this vector bundle does not vanish at epsilon equal to zero. Right? So you might think, well, of course it vanishes. I see an epsilon right there. But the thing is that this epsilon doesn't count as a coefficient. This vector field, this section, is not epsilon times some other section of this vector bundle. So this, you don't get to evaluate this epsilon and then multiply by this. The epsilon is part of the package of this section. Similarly, theta over epsilon as a section of the dual bundle is non-degenerate at epsilon equal to zero. The one over epsilon doesn't count as a coefficient. It's just an, an indivisible part of the section. Uh, in particular, G epsilon is a, a bundle metric on, well, it's a bundle metric on every epsilon slice of this tangent bundle, but uh, that's true all the way down to epsilon equal to zero. So this lets us work with uh, this metric all the way down to epsilon equal to zero and to make uniform statements about it. And so it's a very convenient formalism to introduce. So is this tangent bundle a Lie algebra? It, uh, it, it well, in this case, no, because of the non-integrability of, um, of the contact distribution. Oh. But in other settings, you would get a Lie algebra. Okay, so um, corresponding to this metric, the, we'll introduce the differential forms, uh, the sub Riemannian limit differential forms, uh, which would look like um, this the theta now gets a 1 over epsilon attached to it. So, of course, here I really just mean the exterior powers of the uh, SR cotangent bundle. So corresponding to this splitting, the exterior derivative, well, now it does depend on epsilon because we're not, we're not acting on the usual differential forms. And it gets weights on the off diagonal terms like this. Correspondingly, the dual looks like that, and so the Hodge Laplacian starts with terms that look like one over epsilon squared, and, and well here, so you just have the L and the L star squared, then you would have something one over epsilon, and you'd keep going until you get something um, with a coefficient of epsilon squared. Okay, so what Mattel Melrose do is they say to consider these spaces, these, I'll denote them as E because they're like the pages of the spectral sequence. So we're going to look at the differential forms at epsilon equal to zero. <clears throat> so P is the degree of the differential form and K is going to tell us about how well we can extend it off from epsilon equal to zero uh, into uh, the uh, formal null space of the Laplacian. So that is, we're going to ask that there be some differential form that extends. So when you restrict the epsilon equal to zero, you get back this u. And when I hit it with the Hodge Laplacian, I get something of order uh, epsilon to the k minus two. <clears throat> 
maybe a better way to say this is if I multiply Laplace input time with epsilon squared so that now it starts at, at epsilon to the zero, then this vanishes to order epsilon to the K. So, so if K is equal to zero, then there's no restriction here. And I'm just looking at the differential forms restricted to epsilon equal to zero. Let me write that down. P zero, this is just these weighted differential forms, but restricted to epsilon equal to zero. And what Mattel Melrose and Foreman showed is that this converges to compute the, the RAM cohomology. Uh, in fact, it stabilizes after finitely many pages. So after finitely many uh, steps of doing this, you end up computing the Duram cohomology. Okay, so we want to see what conditions does it impose on you for there to be such an extension. Right, so what you want to do is, well, start with a U, consider any extension, hit that with the Laplacian, and see what conditions you need to impose on U in order to, to get this extra vanishing. So let's do the first step. If, um, if you give me something in U naught, in E naught, then this will be in E1, precisely when Ah, the leading term, which we see here, if this coefficient vanishes, so if a squared, oh, sorry, let's call this a squared. If a squared uh, times u is equal to zero, which is the same from the definition we gave of the run complex, is the same as asking that u is in the Riemann complex. Now, some elementary Hodge theory allows you to show that anything in E1 is also in E2. But then if you give me a form that's in E2, there's an obstruction to uh, being in E3, to finding an extension that vanishes uh, even better. And that's dh plus delta h squared times u should vanish, right? So to say that uh, u was in E1, we just required that u was in the null space of this a squared. To say that E1 is the same as E2 is to say that I can always perturb a u in E1 by something of order epsilon to make the next coefficient uh, vanish when I apply Laplace. Uh, so the reason that here I'm getting a differential operator of order two is because the the choice of coefficient uh, to extend u and achieve this was the differential operator of order one. So now when when I look at the next term up in the expansion, right, uh, I get a differential operator of order two. So, um, but we notice that this if we're not in middle degree, then these are the harmonic forms in the Riemann complex. So outside of middle degree, the Riemann complex just has this as differential. And so this is precisely the harmonic equation. And since the Riemann complex computes the Duram cohomology, um, this shows that E3 is already the, the stable, the E infinity page for all of these P. Now again, some simple um, Hodge theory can be used to see that 
uh, E3 is the same as E4, but then if a differential form is in E4, it'll be in E5 if and only if uh, dh plus dh star squared u is equal to zero. So oh, I should have mentioned that here, the, the fact that this shows up is, is not something that you have to impose. The, the analysis of the, um, the terms in the expansion of the Laplacian give you the differential in the Riemann complex. And same thing here, the um, analyzing the, um, the expansion of the Laplacian and trying to get a differential form to have an extension that vanishes five orders better than, than you had a right to uh, expect generically uh, gives you this operator. So the the second order differential operator in the uh, Riemann complex. Uh, but again, here we notice that this is the um, harmonic equation for middle degree in the, in the Riemann complex. So the spectral sequence, this, this Hodge theoretic version has uh, stabilized at the fifth page. Okay, so to summarize, if we were to set, let's say G, P, K to be the things in the kth page, but not in uh, K plus one, then we've shown that When you take the differential forms and restrict epsilon equal to zero, uh, there are up to four pieces with this piece showing up only if you're in middle degree and this piece being the harmonic forms in the Riemann complex. Also, the, the way this is constructed, we have a preferred extension operator. Let's call it phi, which would be a direct sum of the appropriate pieces. So a good heuristic A good heuristic is to keep track of just the leading terms. So when I take the Laplacian and I compose it with the extension operator, what I get is one over epsilon squared, a squared phi naught, uh, then Uh, dh plus delta h squared uh, applied to phi two, uh, composed with phi two, and then epsilon squared times dh plus dh dual squared composed with phi four. So of course this is this is only approximate because uh, there there would be other terms involving phi zero further up in the expansion and further terms involving phi two further up in the expansion and so on. But it's a good heuristic to keep in mind these leading terms. In particular, this tells us what to expect for the heat kernel So I'll emphasize it heuristically the heat kernel of the Hodge Laplacian should look something like um, e to the minus t over epsilon squared 
a squared times the projection onto the g uh, zero part uh, plus e to the minus t dh plus delta h squared um, times the projection onto the g2 part. And then e to the minus epsilon squared t dh plus dh star squared times the projection onto the g4 part, right? And uh, just to say again, uh, this is a differential operator of order two, and uh, this is a differential operator of order four. So the, and this is a differential operator of order zero. So the different pieces do have very different homogeneities. Okay, so that's uh, heuristically, uh, the theorem is to, is to make a, a precise and correct statement. So, so we show that, I'll phrase it like this and then hopefully give you more details um, about what I mean in a moment. So if you're not in middle degree, then there is a manifold with corners, which uh, I call the sub-Riemannian limit heat space uh, outside of middle degree, on which the heat kernel of the hodge laplacian is smooth an inverted commas um, but of course the point is to get a uniform statement all the way down to epsilon equal to zero so the way to do that is we introduce boundary hypersurfaces uh, capturing the different asymptotic regimes. So capturing the asymptotics as t goes to zero with epsilon positive, as t goes to zero like epsilon squared, and as um, epsilon goes to zero and t stays positive. Right? Uh, and then the inverted commas around smooth, it is Really, I mean uh, what's known as polyhomogeneous, which means that you have asymptotic expansions. You're smooth in the interior, and you have asymptotic expansions as you approach each boundary hypersurface. But the co the exponents in those asymptotic expansions might not be positive integers. Uh, they will definitely not be. They'll include negative integers, and they could include logarithms. Uh, similarly, for P inside middle degree, but uh, with another, mm. so here I'll say for one over epsilon squared times the Laplacian. Uh, this is mostly a matter of convenience. You could construct the heat space for um, uh, the Laplacian itself, but because of this factor of epsilon squared times t, this would require, to capture all the asymptotics, you would have to compactify at, at when t goes to infinity and introduce new boundary faces there. So it's just more convenient to use one over epsilon squared times the Laplacian so that all of the um, boundary faces you need are, are uh, for a finite time. Um, and with one more asymptotic regime, Uh, t goes to zero, like epsilon to the fourth. So in this case, we have t going to zero like epsilon to the fourth at one face, and t going to zero like epsilon squared at a different face. Uh, what this means for the trace of the heat kernel, extremely effective. By the 19th century, we had a picture of For the trace of the heat kernel, so if P is outside of middle degree, 
then this looks like, okay, well, if, um, if epsilon is positive, then of course there's nothing happening. This just looks the, the usual way. If, if you have um, t going to epsilon, t plus epsilon squared, square root going to zero, then you get an asymptotic expansion like that. And then at the other limit, I'll just put the leading term and this is as epsilon goes to zero and t positive. So here, um, an important thing is that the AK are local. That's of course very standard, but so are the other, the capital AKs. And uh, in, in middle degree, this is modify, uh, modified as you would expect. Uh, so this doesn't change. Positive. We have row to row uh, sub four. Which is T plus epsilon to the fourth going to zero. We have row two. Uh, plus I'll put the constant term. The constant term is some renormalized integral of the trace of the minus, uh, well, let's use tau, uh, dh plus delta h squared uh, projected to g2. P tau plus O of rho two. This is as rho two goes to zero. And then uh, finally, trace of e to the minus t dh plus dh star squared uh, projected to the g4 part plus o of epsilon as epsilon goes to zero for t bounded. So you get this sort of asymptotic expansions. And of course, this is a, a somewhat clumsy way of explaining the structure of the trace of the heat kernel. Really, there's also a manifold with corners on which this is an essentially smooth function. But this is perhaps a simpler way of, of saying this. And I get to point out here that the, all of these coefficients, all of the, um, the ones that occur with negative powers of the corresponding function are local. So one advantage or consequence of those coefficients being local is that if, if you introduce bundle coefficients, so let's say you have some flat bundles, of the same rank, then all of those local terms are going to be the same. So the trace of uh, the heat kernel when you're using coefficients in F1 and the trace of the heat kernel when you're using coefficients in F2, well, the difference actually converges as epsilon goes to zero. And um, Okay, so we can use this then, now that we have the trace of the heat kernel, to look at global spectral invariance. So you can look, for example, at eight invariance. So I'll label this with a, a one because I'll come back in a moment and tell you about work of Ruman and his collaborators. Um, but it follows from uh, from this, these results that if you look at the, um, the eight invariant and you take its finite part as epsilon goes to zero because it doesn't converge as epsilon goes to zero, you get the eight invariant of the contact complex, the Ruman complex, um, plus something that's local. Uh, so in particular, if you were to take the difference of eight invariants, so the row invariant, for example, then uh, you get the same answer with the uh, contact eight invariants as you do with the uh, Riemannian eight invariants. Uh, and similarly, you uh, can look at analytic torsion. Uh, so uh, this 
Analytic torsion is uh, almost always used with uh, coefficients in a flat bundle. And so I'll label this with two again, because uh, I'll come back to previous work in a second. But the analytic torsion of Ray and Singer uh, coincides with the analytic torsion of the Riemann complex, which was introduced by Riemann and Seshadri, uh, up to something local. And so in particular, if you take a relative analytic torsion, uh, then that coincides with the relative contact analytic torsion. And of course, the analytic torsion is the subject of the Chigger-Muller theorem. And so this connects the contact analytic torsion, or at least the relative one, to a, um, a topological invariant. OK, so uh, the previous work I wanted to mention is for one, uh, Bicard, Herslich, and Ruman uh, proved one if M is a um, three dimensional uh, CR ciphered manifold. Uh, so that means that it's a three dimensional contact manifold. The almost complex structure in the metric is uh, integrable, and the um, the red vector field is the infinitesimal generator of a, an S1 action, locally free, obviously, uh, on the uh, manifold. Uh, so in this case, uh, they showed um, the first equality, uh, and they can compute the local term. Uh, sadly, we have not been able to compute this local term. Um, but in, in this particular case, 3D CR cipher, they are able to compute it. Uh, then for, for two, uh, Ruman and Seshadri as I mentioned, they're the ones who introduced analytic torsion in this setting. And uh, they showed that if um, the same hypothesis, if M is 3D, CR ciphered, then two is true and the local term vanishes. Uh, so in that case, uh, in the 3D CR ciphered, these are equal. For general 3D um, contact manifolds, they introduce a they take their contact analytic torsion and they show that there is some local uh, perturbation of it that gives you a contact invariant. Uh, now in, in three dimensions, it's known that there are no local contact invariants. So um, it follows from our result together with theirs that uh, the, um, what they call uh, I don't remember what they call it, but um, let's just put a bar on it. Their modified version is equal to the ordinary uh, analytic torsion because combining um, our result with theirs, uh, the difference is uh, a local contact invariant and in three dimensions, uh, there are no local contact invariants. Uh, Kitaoka has introduced a, another um, modification of analytic torsion on contact spheres. And um, using representation theory, he's able to compute exactly what the difference between uh, the um, Ray Singer analytic torsion and his analytic torsion is. And he gets something very explicit like the logarithm of n factorial. Uh, we're able to show that um, his torsion differs from um, this in, in arbitrary dimensions by something local, but again, we don't know what the local term is. Um, okay, so then in the 
four remaining minutes, I wanted to say something about the proof, but maybe I'll just um, remind you or tell you in case you haven't seen uh, Melrose's construction of the heat kernel of why uh, specifying a, a manifold with corners uh, tells you all of this information about the heat kernel. So let me just remind you um, of one way of looking at the, the Euclidean heat kernel uh, and an appropriate manifold with corners. So, um, so the method of proof, radial blow up. So let's say that you're looking at the Euclidean heat kernel. So you have four pi T to the minus N over two. And you look at the exponential of minus, uh, let's say, theta minus theta tilde squared over 4t. So this lives on um, Rn cross Rn cross t. And it's well behaved, more or less, everywhere, except that the diagonal at time zero, of course, where this quotient is just still defined. And so <clears throat> what you want to do to resolve that is introduce polar coordinates, but take them seriously. So you're going to introduce a new boundary hypersurface where you had the, the problem behavior. So what I mean is let's say that you take R to be the distance to the diagonal at time zero, and then you introduce the sort of projective um, polar coordinates, projective angular variables like so. So there's a blow down map there. And if you were to pull back the kernel along that map, you would get this expression. Okay, and now the point of course is that the, the size of this variable squared plus this variable squared is equal to one. And uh, so in this quotient, it's no longer possible for the top and the bottom to vanish at the same time. So now I have a, a well-defined limit, like this, this is a well-behaved function on the entire space. But I've introduced a new boundary hypersurface because when you when you take polar coordinates seriously at r equal to zero, you have uh, all of the possible directions of approach. So this resolves the singularity in the Euclidean heat kernel by introducing this boundary hypersurface. And the, the proof of the theorem is just a construction of the heat kernel where Every time there's an asymptotic regime we want to understand, we introduce an appropriate boundary hypersurface by putting the, uh, taking polar coordinates and taking them seriously. And then we just show that uh, when you look at the heat kernel, when you lift it to the appropriately blown up space, that you end up with something that is essentially smooth. And I'm out of time, so I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Pierre? Please just unmute yourself if you have one. Are there explicit formulas known if in the case of the Heisenberg group? I mean, can we see some of this in action uh, in some, some simple case, just like you can write down the formula for the Euclidean heat kernel? So uh, yes and no. Uh, so there, there is, of course, a lot of, of harmonic analysis done on the Heisenberg group itself. Uh, yes. So uh, for example, uh, Taylor's book um, on non-commutative harmonic analysis uh, talks about it. Uh, but if you want to have like this um, degeneration, uh, Berger spheres are an example of this degeneration, uh, this sub Riemannian limit and um, on, on functions, you can just write down a formula for the heat kernel uh, with the uh, parameters. So the heat kernel uh, for epsilon, for all epsilon. Uh, but on differential forms, um, I don't know of any explicit formula. Uh -huh.
when you can see this. Okay, interesting. Other questions for Pierre? And, and, the, and the geometric space you get, let's say for the Heisenberg group, it, you can't say what it is or for SU2 or something. It's not some- uh, Yeah, so I think friend. what happens, uh, so the Heisenberg group itself is just like Rn. Uh, right, I mean, it is RN. It's just with a different group structure, and so it's it's just like uh, in this in this picture, uh, this you can identify this space as you know with the compactified normal bundle to the diagonal, which is just a compactified tangent bundle of the manifold, and so uh, every fiber here is just a compactification of RN, and so when you're constructing the um, heat kernel on a uh, on a closed manifold. The picture of the heat space looks the same. On each of these fibers, you would use this as the model, right? So it's the same thing when you're constructing the, the contact heat kernel or any of these um, uh, Hodge Laplacian heat kernels. Uh, you, um, you have a similar space, but it's just the homogeneity is different so that this fiber, instead of identifying it with Rn, you identify it with the Heisenberg group. I see. So it's just the, um, if you like, the, uh, the composition um, restricts to it to be the convolution product in the Heisenberg group. I see, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? 